four, five, six, seven, eight. I believe it's not too late. Together we can change the world. Lay the puzzle pieces out. Find out what it's all about. Together we can change the world. Can't do it by myself, so I'm asking for your help. So we can change the world. Stop us where it's been charted, roll your sleeves up, let's get started. Together we can change the world. Together we can change the world. With our hands and with our hearts. Uh, good morning everyone and welcome to the Prince of Wales School. We are live on Facebook and YouTube on Tuesday the 19th of May 2020. Uh, welcome to our assembly time. It's great to have so many people with us. We've got a big hello from Imogen who's tuning in. Thank you Imogen, great to see you. Uh, good morning everyone from the Hoffmans. Hello guys. Welcome, welcome. Uh, a few people saying that that song always brings a tear to their eye. It is a very emotional song, but it's always good to hear. And yes, two years on, um, and it's still just as powerful. Um, wonderful to see so many people saying good morning this morning. Hello from Jason, who's tuning in. Good morning, Jason. Wonderful that you're with us this morning live uh, across the virtual school. Uh, I hope you've had a great morning already, taking part in some power mass challenges. And also, we had a poetry challenge today in literacy. Always good to have a bit of poetry um, to start our morning. Uh, good morning from the Thorpes who are tuning in. Thank you very much for joining us. It's wonderful to have you with us today. Um, I'm very excited that we're really pleased to welcome back a very special guest today. Uh, good morning to Steve Wallace. Hello, Steve. Morning, Mr. Blackland. Hello, everybody. Good morning. You well? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Looking forward it's to this. It's great to have you back. And for those of you uh, who've not met Steve before, Steve Wallace here is a senior archaeologist at Dorset Council. Um, and many of you may remember that he's already led one of our fantastic virtual assemblies where we had a bit of a now and then tour of mainly Dorchester previously, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. And that's right. Uh, you're back by popular demand. <laughs> <laughs> well, I demanded it anyway. <laughs> 
And today we're going to look, um, we're going to have a lo- another little tour uh, of of uh, now and then, maybe broadening our geographical sphere slightly further to look at the rest of Dorset. Is that right? That's it. absolutely correct. Yep. Call um, this one Dorset. All the new. Excellent. So I've got a presentation here. Um, I'm going to click that through. And um, while we go through, we'd love you to um, share your thoughts about the images that we are looking at today and if you've got any questions for steve you can put them in the comment box below so uh we look forward to uh testing your knowledge steve <laughs> Excellent. let's see what we can do well uh we'll we'll click through and uh we'll okay. go through to the next one so do you want to kick off yep i was gonna say these are the same things i showed you last time so many of you would have seen these the things that i mainly use for these old photographs are I'll put them up to the screen for you old postcards which were the text messages of their day that people were using um, from about 1900, well, until quite recently, but especially in the very early 1900s, everyone was doing them all the time to send messages to each other um, in the same way that you might text a friend. So sometimes people sent them from their holidays, but sometimes it was just saying, would you like to come out for a cup of tea tomorrow? Uh, and the post was usually quite quick locally to your area, so you could send a postcard to your, your friends on the other side of town saying, do you want to come for tea tomorrow? And they could send you a response, yes or no, before tomorrow. So you knew whether to get the kettle on or not. <laughs> That's great. And uh, this is a good example. And you can date them because there's a postmark. Uh, this is one I showed you before. You do actually see in the top right-hand corner, it says Sherborne off to one side. And it gives a date. And it's March uh, 18th, I think it is, in 10. That's 1910. So that tells you when the postcard was sent. It doesn't tell you when the picture on the other side was taken because that was probably taken a few years ago or years before that. So we're going to have a look at some examples to see outside Dorchester to give you a wider idea of the things you can see. And I'm going to start on this one because this took me some figuring out. This one did. I was trying to work out where this was taken. And if you look and the old picture, the one on the left, and compare it to my one. Well, first of all, there's a bit of a clue because in the bottom left-hand corner of the old picture on the left, it says an old bit of pool. So I think, well, that's pool then. Yep, I know it's the right town. And it's in the old part of the town. So that's the bit down by the quay, if you know pool. But beyond that, it was a bit difficult because Dorchester survived pretty well. But pool was one of those places that got bombed a lot in the Second World War. And also big areas afterwards then got sort of flattened and redeveloped. So it's not always that easy to work out where a picture was taken. So in this case, um, I had a clue. As you can see in the background, there's a church tower. And that's St. James's Church. So to try and find that spot, I set off around Pool, trying to work out somewhere that had that right angle for the church tower in the distance, about the right size. And I reckon I found it in this little road. And you won't believe me, but that road is called Barber's Piles. And it is still there, honest. Please look on a map, Mr. Spracklin, if you disagree, if you think I'm making this up. It is genuinely true. But there's a, one or two more clues in that picture that tells you that um, I'm at the right spot, I think. Because though some of the houses have gone, the ones on the right have gone completely. Uh, there's some on the left. Uh, the little row of houses. I've got a slightly different angle in my picture, but they're still there. Um, so the house on the right are mostly, oh, sorry, on the left are still there. And there's also a chimney on the right. But what's also I, quite interesting in this whole picture is I think it's a bit of a fiddle, a bit of a con. I was telling you last time that some of these pictures were coloured in artificially. Basically, someone coloured them in, took a black and white picture and coloured them in and then printed them off. Now, I think there were, well, there were five people in that picture and I think only three of them are really there. There were two I think they're women and they're sitting, uh, standing outside their front doors. And there's also a girl in the street. They look like they've been posed for the photo, which means the photographer's got them to sit, to stand in the exact position that he wants them. And then in the front, there's this funny old character with a box. He's some sort of peddler or someone selling something. And I don't think he's real. I think he's been drawn in there for to make it look a bit more interesting. Because otherwise, why would you get that little girl to pose in that picture and then stick someone in front of her? And mm. I'm not sure about the lady that's walking away either. So that's the sort of thing you do. with it. So these are good historical documents, but you've got to watch it. The colours you can't trust and sometimes some of the details, uh, I think, are a bit made up. But have a look at that maybe later and see what you think. 
Imogen's comparing the experience of sending postcards with perhaps sending an instant message now. And she says it must have been hard using postcards because you have to buy the stamps and they may not answer so quickly from Imogen. Absolutely. You can't have a conversation where you're toing and throwing, sending messages all the time. If you mm -hmm. want to do that, you'd probably take you weeks if you're the person you were speaking to was in the other side of the country. Shall we go on to the next one? Yeah, here we go. Now, this is one of my favourite towns in Dorset. We've gone from Poole over in the east to Bridport in the west. And again, details at the bottom, you might be able to see saying it's Paul, Bridport from Hyde Corner. It's up on the east side of the town and you see old Bridport as it was, I think, about 1905. So 115 years ago. And you're looking down onto the old part of the town, which when you go to the town now, is still the sort of the town centre, the main shopping area around South Street and East and West Street. And if you look on the left-hand edge, right almost at the edge, you'll just see a tower. That's the parish church. So that'll give you an idea for the next picture. But also, if you look in the background, you'll see the hills. Uh, and sort of on the left side of the middle in the distance, there's quite a, a, a pointed hill with nothing on it. Well, when you have a look on the next picture, the one taken I took a few years ago, you'll see that something, that's the one. The arrow was pointing in the right spot. Thank you, Mr. Spracklin. Have a look at that spot now. It's got trees on it. That is Colmer's Hill. That's exactly right. And if you go to Bridport now or maybe drive around the bypass, Colmer's Hill is a very obvious landmark because of those trees on it. But they're not in my old picture because my picture was taken about 1905. And it wasn't until about 10 years later that those trees were planted. There were some pine trees put on there by the landowner because he thought that the soil of the hill was unstable. So it was like a slip cause landslip so he thought that by planting trees on the top the trees would hold the roots together um, and he may be right because the hill's still there and can you see in my modern picture you see the church again almost on the left hand side so that gives you an idea of the scale but there's been a lot of change in the foreground in the old picture you've got uh, you might just really see this in front of the town there's some countryside but there's also a line running down it that's the old railway line that went down to West Bay uh, and you can still see the old railway station in West Bay itself if you go there. But that railway line, I think, became the bypass. So in the modern picture, there's houses in that area. Uh, and that line has become the bypass, which you can't see in my picture because of the trees. But if you go to go to Bridport and you start driving down the bypass, and if you're heading down towards West Bay, that's the bit of road you go on. And you can also see in my picture that not only has the housing appeared in the foreground, in the front, but also... The town spread quite a lot, like particularly over the far right-hand corner, Allington Hillway, I think it is. Uh, you can see how the town has, has really built up over the last 100 years or so, like most towns in Dorset have done. Uh, we've got a few more people saying hello. We've got Rosa who's saying hello. We've got good morning, morning Rosa. Rosa. Abel. Uh, we've got a big, very big good morning, everyone, from the Wilson family. A very good morning. <laughs> And uh, we've got a good morning from the Baker family as well. Good morning, everyone. It's great to have so many people joining us live. Uh, let's have a look at the next image. Hi, folks. And to my colleague, Emma, who um, I know. Here we go. Yeah, now we've nipped down into Bridport itself, down into East Street. And I think this picture is taken about 1900. And it shows a fairly typical street scene. I, if you remember last time, I showed you one of uh, Dorchester outside Judge Jeffrey's. And that was quite similar in that the, the town streets are often quite empty. There's a few, there's obviously lots of shops there and there's a few horse and carts and a few other things there. But really, it would be quite safe to walk in the street. Now, if you compare it with my picture taken a few years ago, uh, you wouldn't just wander down the street because, as you'll see, I had to be really careful where I took my picture because there's just lots of traffic around. Um but then when you start comparing the two pictures, you will see that there's quite a lot of the buildings are still there. The shop bits at the, the ground floor level may have changed, but the upper upper floors, the upper stories, um, they're often quite similar. And you will also see the town hall in the background, right at the central crossroads of the town. Let's just have a sort of look at those two. What was the thinking? What was the thinking, Steve, of the size of the roads in this first picture? Because in many medieval um, city layouts, the streets would be very, very close, wouldn't they? 
Yeah. But then over time, there's the separation, which obviously now has allowed for the road. But what was the reasoning behind the wider roads before that? I think a good one in Bridport, because the earliest bit of Bridport from about a thousand years ago was actually around in South Street. And the parish church down in South Street was actually probably about the center of the old town. Uh, and in, oh, you've got your testament now, in the 1300s, Bridport expanded. So the section that you see here is in East Street. Well, the whole bit along West and East Street was deliberately laid out in the 1300s as like a, a deliberate expansion of the town. And people could come along um, and basically buy a house plot for their house and have some land at the back to grow their food and whatever. Um, but I think also a lot of the reason here was this was the main road. It's now the bypass to take traffic around Bridport, but then it was the main road to Exeter. So one of the main roads on the south coast of England. So they probably wanted lots of traffic there anyway. But also, mm -hmm. as you see now when you go there, that also meant there was room to uh, have markets in the street. And you can still mm -hmm. see markets on the um, on the roadside, uh, at least in Bridport on Saturdays. Uh, when we do a unit of work with Year 2, we talk about the Great Fire of London and how before the Great Fire of London, the streets were very close together, but the redesign of the city meant that streets are made wider as well. And I yeah. want to know a bit of modelling on London, perhaps, and other big areas. I don't know. Yeah, I think if you had you had a fire in your town, you thought very seriously again before you rebuilt. You, you know, you really learnt your lessons the, the hard way. That's it. Ah, now, this is a guess one for you. This is a village, and there is a very big clue, I think, of what the name of that village is in the background. So I wonder if anyone can guess what village it is. Oh, can you, can you, guess? can you put a comment in that comment box for those people that are watching live? Yeah. Uh, can you name this village just by looking at this photo? When do you think this photo was taken? I think it was taken about the 1930s, and the village is quite, strung out so over on the right hand side you'll see the parish church in the background and this is one of the streets it's called west street uh, and when this picture was taken it was still a sort of a few cottages lovely old cottages on the left and you see a bit of one on the right strung out along this street but the the village had already started to expand because uh, on the left side of the church as you look at it you'll see some what were then quite modern houses that have probably only just been built so the place is starting to expand and it's after the first world war when a lot of places a lot of people started realizing that they needed better housing for people so we like old fat cottages now but actually sometimes they could be drafty damp places to live in so um 50 or 70 years ago people were often deliberately knocking down fat cottages and building other things that they thought people could could live in more more safely more healthily we got any guesses yet Mm. we've got our first guess mm. is it Corf? yeah well done it's Corf castle because there's Corf castle in the background in the distance so you're quite a way out from center of the village now but if we look at the modern picture please mr Spr mr spracklin you'll see that things have changed because there's been lots more housing built so you from this angle i took this picture a few years ago you can't now see the castle because there's houses in the way. Um, you can still see the church in the distance and you can still see that same thatched cottage on the right hand side. But I'm not sure about this one on the left. It might be a new house, but it might be that someone um, massively rebuilt that thatched cottage because it may, feel, may still be the same stone walls, but they got rid of the thatched roof, they added an upper floor. Um, I think they put slates on the roof, as I can see. Yeah, and put new windows in. But it might be the same building. So that's something that some people did. In some cases, they knocked down fast cottages and, and built new houses on the spot. In other cases, they converted them. And it's sometimes only when you look at old pictures that you can realise that some of the old, uh, that some of the cottages actually were old. They're not that modern. It's just that they've been modernised. Ah, yeah. Now, this is a favourite of mine. Last time, for those of you who remember, I showed you that picture of the Boer Gardens in Dorchester. Um, a couple of pictures of the Boer Gardens and also of the clock tower. Uh, and the Boer Gardens were laid out in about the 1890s. Uh, and then the clock tower was added in about 1905. And I did say that that was a thing that was going on quite a lot at the time. Lots of towns, as they were expanding a bit over 100 years ago, they decided they needed some park, some green space, 
where people could exercise um, because because the, the, the towns were getting bigger. For some people, the countryside was actually getting quite a long way away. And this is what's happened here in, in Sherborne. Although actually what's what they did here is that in 1905, they had a pageant, it's a big celebration, a big fair. And they were marking the fact in 1905 that, well, the fact that there'd been a town there for 1,200 years. So they had a pageant and then decided they were gonna lay out some gardens as part of the celebration and call them pageant gardens. So this picture was taken, I think probably only maybe three years or so later, let's just guess at 1908, something like that. Uh, the gardens have only just been laid out and you can really see that the, uh, there's a bandstand just like there is in Dorchester and there's a nice pond in the foreground. Uh, but most of the trees and scrubs and shrubs look pretty small and you can easily see the railway station which show one railway station there, which is the brick building in the background. But when you compare now, you go to the same spot and you will see the same pond. It's been shaped a bit. You can probably on the left hand side see the bandstand. Uh, but again, it's all covered in trees because they've had what over 110 years to grow since that last picture was taken. So um, just like in Dorchester, the same thing's happening. They planted the trees, they look small and now you know, now we are benefiting because we can see those gardens with lovely, mature trees uh, and shrubs in them. Beautiful. Uh, now, has this got the name in it? Ah, I was going to let you guess where this was, but you will be able to see because in the bottom left hand corner, it says Swanage. So we've popped off the other way. Chevron was up north from Dorchester. We've now headed east. A bit southeast, really, down to the coast of Swanage. Lovely seaside place. And you will think that now is somewhere to go for a day out or a bit of the people from other parts of the country would come to on holiday. But actually, until about 200 years ago, or maybe a bit less, Swanage was a fishing village and also somewhere that a lot of the stone that was being quarried locally was being taken away to places like London to be used in buildings. And in this picture in 1905, you can sort of see a mix of that. There were fishing boats, um, I think, pulled up on the shore. Uh, there were some other ones, sailing boats that people look like they're having holiday makers are enjoying themselves in uh, out to sea. Uh, and you will see that, well, when we compare in a minute, but you will see this, that the main bit of the town is on the left and just outside a shop, but there's a few houses dotted around the bay. And also in the foreground, you'll see there's a boat pulled up at a, a stone jetty with people standing on it. And that's quite an historic jetty because that was actually built in 1825 by the local MP, a man called William Morton Pitt, who wanted to help the fishermen, give them somewhere to unload their boats, but also somewhere where the what were then smaller boats that were taking stone out from the local quarries could moor up against and use for loading. So this picture, uh, yeah, I want my court year, do I think this was? I think about, yeah, about 1910, you see this sort of mix of fishing but also holiday makers and the start of a holiday resort. If you compare the view today in my modern picture, taken a few years ago, you will see quite a change. That pier is still there, uh, but people are just using it to wander along and enjoy themselves. And there's people on the beach, there's the old boat there, but that's about it. But also in the background, can you see it's a lot more housing as more hotels have grown up and houses of people have come to live there um, and Swanage has really expanded around the bay. So that bit of open country in the middle is now filled with buildings. And we've now gone across to that open bit of land and I'm gonna show you hopefully a sequence of three pictures of Swanage. Um, and this one is taken, let me just check my dates. I think about 1905. And if you know Swanage, that road that's coming in on the left-hand side is Victoria Avenue. But the areas around it looks pretty, well, wild, uncultivated. It's it's not even parkland, is it? It looks like it's just rough ground. But it's quite interesting what you see on the seafront. There's people on the Esplade, the seafront, parading along in um, horses and carriages and so forth. But there's also those funny little box things parked on the beach. And you, some, you actually see one of those today if you go down to Weymouth. And the, I think these are ridiculous. They're called bathing machines. And it's when people were, I think, actually quite quite embarrassed about 
how they would dress. They wouldn't just go running off down to the beach in their swimming costumes. It was very much more genteel in those days. So you went into what was a bathing machine, which was basically a shed on wheels. And you got in there and you got changed into your from your formal clothes into your swimming costume. Meanwhile, someone with a horse and cart, uh, the horse would drag it out a little way into the water so that you could then get out um, in your sw swimming costume in your swimming togs and go for a little swim um relax a bit of privacy as you thought before getting back into your um little bathing machine and going back to the to land um get changed again i'm paying someone quite a bit of money to do that and you can see that some of those is, there's quite a big bathing machine on the right uh, and they look like some smaller ones dotted along so yeah up to 100 110 years ago um, that was the normal way that um the genteel classes, the middle classes, had their holidays. Not like today, where you just go along in your swimming costume, take your, maybe cover yourself with a pullover or something, take that off and get in the water. None of that. It was much more formal. And if we then look at the next picture, taken about 15 years ago, 15 years later, sorry, about 1920, you see things have changed. Roughly the same spot, but this path's been laid out in the foreground, so that's becoming more of a parkland. Um, you can't see any of those bathing machines, um, but there's lots of huts. I said like 20, it might be 1930 or so. Um, so anyway, 20 or so years later, lots, what people had then, they didn't have bathing machines, but they had little huts. Um, so actually some quite big ones in the foreground where they could get changed. Uh, and also along the beach, what weren't in the previous picture are what are called groins, those wooden structures which help to hold the sand together. Uh, as um, as the currents uh, otherwise would take it away uh, and help to sort of stabilise the beach. But you can also see in the background there's more housing. That in the previous picture there's just a few houses in the distance. There's now more, and it's and it's coming closer in. Could you perhaps just go back one, please, Mr. Spackland, just so they compare? That's it. You see, just there we are. About 1905. Um, you just see a few houses clustered in the distance, and then the next one, please you'll see that there's more housing. And then if we come on to the modern view, which I took about five years ago, uh, again, it's changed again. Still some huts, different type in the in the foreground, very definitely park in front of you. Um, no more bathing machines, uh, but more again, more housing in the background. Um, and uh, you can still see the groins as well, just about. And of course, modern cars and um, quite a lot more people around. Just going back to um, some of the photos, um, in this photo, we're talking about the bathing machines. And Jason said, he mentioned what you did, that there's also a bathing hut on Weymouth Seafront. And That's course, right, yep. Weymouth became famous for, for that, didn't it? Um, King George? Yep, King George famously did. Yes, there's a story recently that went in, when King George went in one of those bathing machines, he thought he was going in, in privacy. But when he got out of the bathing machine to swim, there was a band that started playing God Save the King in the next <laughs> bathing machine. Uh, good, loyal folk thinking they were doing the right thing with the king probably thinking, I wish they'd just go away. Um, when we were looking at the garden in Sherborne, Imogen yeah. said that was a beautiful garden. Lovely. Thank you, Imogen. Uh, so next we're going on to West Bay and back west again. So West Bay, which is near Bridport. Uh, again, you can see quite a lot of change here um, in a similar sort of way to what I think I showed you last time. I showed you uh, some examples of some change at uh, Old Harry, Harry Rocks over at Studland. Well, you sort of see something happening here and lots of other changes. I think this picture is taken about 1920, so 100 years ago. And it's up on the cliffs on the west side of West Bay. Looking back, um, you can see the big set of houses called Pier Terrace, which is still there today. Um, you can see part of the harbour mouth, the sort of pier thing going out on the right-hand side. And in the foreground, you will see a big, wide, um, I suppose, road sort of seafront esplanade with some lovely old cars dotted around on it and some sort of little, little shacks almost, little holiday homes just springing up on the left-hand side. But what's also interesting is that from this spot, you will see at the bottom right-hand corner a dark thing, and that is the other side of the bay, effectively. That's the cliff. Now, 
when we compare with my picture that I took in, I think it was 2014, that's gone. That whole chunk of um, cliff is gone. And I'll show you, get a better view in, in a minute. But that was because um, of the same thing that I've been, I was telling you about before, that coastal erosion where storms batter the land and um, the softer rock especially falls away. And I'm pretty sure that that happened in about 1950s. There was a very big storm in the early 1950s and much of that chunk of land was lost. And I think afterwards people just decided to sort of flatten it out and level it out. But you can, well, first of all, I should say, so to look at that bit of the, of the seafront, I've had to go further back to get the same height. But you can see um, there's a lot more development. Pier Terrace is only just visible. Um, the harbour mouth has, has been rebuilt and there's a lot more housing in the foreground. And then, if, but then if we go back even further to about 1905, that's, that's it, the next one, please. That's it. A picture taken further up. You can get a good idea of what I was talking about, about that big chunk of land, which is now quite near the front because we've gone higher and further back up the cliff that was lost. And you've got a lovely old view of what West Bay was like uh, over 100 years ago. Pier Terrace is in there. It's, this is all being coloured in and quite badly. Some of the cliffs that should be more of a sort of golden or sandy colour are pretty black. But at least it gives you a good idea of what was there. But you can still see that big Pier Terrace. You can see the harbour mouth. But if you sort of look inland, it's all a bit backlands, isn't it? There's not much going on. Well, that was because... I suppose West Bay hadn't really got going as, as so much as a holiday resort, but also it was quite industrial. Um, in the 1800s, at one point, it was said that Bridport, uh, West Bay was the second biggest producer of ships in Britain, or maybe it was England, but certainly one of the big ones. So there were a lot of shipbuilding going on and a lot of industry uh, and fishing as well. So whereas now we think of West Bay mainly as somewhere to go for a holiday, maybe look at a few fishing boats, um, somewhere to pot around on your day off. Then it was it was very much a working place. And um, if you look ooh, sort of just bottom left of centre, there's a green greenish area there. Well, that I think was uh, cultivation. So it's maybe allotments or fruit growing or something like that. So it was you know quite a practical place in its time. And here's the here's the last ones I think because this is showing you something that. 100 years ago, people thought was perfectly acceptable, but now you probably get shot for. Because this is going closer up to that further cliff, the one in the in the previous picture, the one in the background, going looking close up. And this picture, the old picture was taken about 1920, so about 100 years ago. And it's what someone thought was quite an interesting local activity that made a good subject for a postcard. And it's, I don't know what it says, um, no, but it's actually what they're doing is digging some of the stone away, some of the the beach, some of the, the pebbles on the beach. Um, and the there are two men there. Carting oh. sand. Carting sand. That's it. Thank you. Yes, they're carting it away. It's perfectly normal. It was done in daylight and everything. Um, they took along car. They were builders would come along. They wanted some sand or some gravel or something like that. So they just dig some off the beach. Mm -hmm. Now, people thought, well, that's OK. They're not taking much. It's only a cartload every now and again. By about the 1980s, people in West Bay were thinking, hang on a minute, they're coming on with big diggers and taking lorry loads away. This is not good. And also, people were getting much more aware that there was a, a danger, taking, that the beach was actually helping to protect their homes. So when there were storms, the, the beach was absorbing a lot of the impact. So the last thing they wanted was people taking it away. And in fact, when you look at my picture, taken about five years ago, if you look at the level of the beach in the left hand side it's actually been deliberately built up people have actually brought in more more stone to make it higher to protect the beach or protect their houses so really a, a big social change something that at one point people thought that does no harm actually it's quite good because they can then use that for building they're thinking hang on a minute we don't want that happening um so it was quickly put a stop to and if you went down there now with a JCB saying, I want some gravel to bake a new drive, you'd be lucky to get out of West Bay alive. <laughs> and I think that's the last one. Thank oh, you, well, absolutely fantastic. We've really appreciated you joining us again, Steve. It's been a wonderful assembly. Uh, Sue says, really interesting seeing the changes. Thank you for sharing. Cheers, um, Sue. It's been great to have you with us again and uh, looking at all of those.
fantastic photos. Um, everyone who's watching will be back live at four o'clock for our next Today at Power, Today at Power program. Um, I'll say thank you again to Steve for joining us. We'll see you thank again, you. Steve. Okay, we'll do. Thank you. Take care now. Cheers. Bye-bye.